Uh, we have a... I didn't hear, sorry. Hello. I think there was some problem. I'm at Nepal, at Mandu now. Yes. I'm in Lisbon, uh, Portugal. And near Lisbon. Near Lisbon as well. I am in Brussels. Hello, I'm in Kathmandu. Peter? Peter in Boda? All right. <laughs> when, when you're ready, uh, I'm ready. I think we are already. I want to apologize at the beginning because uh, some of our trainees could not make it because they were attending uh, Kenji Premashirov's teachings that happen now. So they will be looking at the, at the recording afterwards and they have included some questions uh, to you. All right. So we're not all here, but everyone will uh, see. And um, what is your name? Tamasaka? No, no, this is the name of the organization, of, the, of our project. My name is Drew Chen. <clears throat> And have we met before? Uh, I don't know. Actually, I came, I was a, a monk in Chechen from 98 onwards, from uh, Yansir uh, uh I was the only French monk there. So maybe we met, or maybe not. I don't remember. Right. And do you have a brother who was a monk at the Sherabling? Yes, yes, exactly. All right. not, I, met, yeah. I met him. Yes, I'm great. So what can I do for you? Uh, well, um, we would like to, since we are all here uh, training translators, people who want to become translator at some point and because of that want to learn Tibetan and uh, Pechas, etc. Then we would like to hear uh, the experience of uh, senior translators uh, and see and learn from uh, your experience. Yes, I'll, I'll uh, be happy to do so. Yes, thank you. And then also, what are the challenges of being a translator? What is the reward of being a translator? And then how can we set ourselves in the, in the good direction right from the start where we are now so that we can go as, as well as possible in the future? <clears throat> the most important is um, taking refuge and the Bodhisattva vow. Nothing more important than that. Because in the Bodhisattva vow is the declaration that you will help all beings in their own languages. And if that involves translating, then so be it. But it's part of your Bodhisattva activity, the application of, of the great wish. And personally, I never aimed at being a translator because that word wasn't really in, in use uh, at the time. My aim was more uh, first to understand and then to help others understand. And in whichever way possible. That could be by um, opening a door for them, by uh, giving access to a teacher and then helping them understand what's being said. But I didn't see myself as the translator with a big T, uh, not at all. It was only because there was nobody else around that knew both languages. So I would say first advice, don't get hung up on the identity of being a translator. It's much better to try to be a um, bodhisattva um, in training. And that could continue for the rest of my life. Uh, thank you. And 
<laughs> so uh, how, how did it happen? Uh, how come you uh, came to know both languages then? Because at the time it was uh, in the previous uh, millennium, there was uh, very few Dharma books and important texts that I was told to study. For example, uh, the words of my perfect teacher was only in Tibetan. And my teacher at the time, Tsungku Pema Wangyal, taught uh, it in Tibetan. And the first time he did that, I freaked out uh, inside like a panic attack. Like, I can't uh, understand Tibetan. And now he's just speaking in Tibetan very slowly and gently and emphasizing. He said, just relax and listen. So I tried to relax and listen. And after a while, I could understand what he said. He was talking on the third of the four boundless uh, attitudes of a Bodhisattva, rejoicing. And somehow it, um, it penetrated uh, my heart through his kindness. And then afterwards, when reading the Tibetan, it's so easy to understand. It's probably the most easy book in Tibetan to read. Because uh, Paltrow Rinpoche, he considered the audience before writing. That's a very important uh, Bodhisattva training, that you, you uh, speak to people, not uh, to a text. And you don't uh, write into a computer. You write for an audience who are going to read it. And who are the readers? Who is the audience? The Bodhisattva needs to be clear about that in order to adjust the vocabulary choice so that these people can understand in, on their own terms. That's very important. Otherwise, you could say that it's an unkind way, like speaking uh, an academic nuclear physic language to um, while you are visiting a kindergarten. That's unkind. And if you go into a university to give a lecture and you speak to them as if they are in kindergarten, it's also unkind. So know your audience and then speak all right. And that automatically <clears throat> um, excludes proving oneself, see what I can do, see how uh, important my work is. I can put in all these references to uh, Sanskrit or Tibetan texts. That is um, um, called a bragging translation, which is not necessary to do that. There are so many other ways we can brag and uh, it should make uh, ourselves important. But in the Dharma context, some kind of uh, natural humility is, is very beneficial for oneself. Yes. So, so uh, then how, how you, so now you just told us how you started to understand both languages and how you studied. And then uh, when did you start actually translating? Was it when people came to visit teachers you were around with or how did it happen? The first time I ever uh, translated uh, orally, it wasn't supposed to be a, a translation. I was just helping one lady yeah, up in the caves above uh, the Lotus Lake in Topema. One Australian woman came to ask for teachings on the 37 practices of a Bodhisattva. And <clears throat> the Lama there, Lama Wangdong, he just said yes. And then I was called for. Why? Because there was nobody else. And I couldn't understand his accent. I didn't know the text. And my Tibetan was uh, fumbling. So I felt it was a complete 
um, failure and disaster. But she was very happy. So that was the beginning. It looks like a great beginning. I guess most of, <clears throat> for most of uh, people, it must have been like that also. At least for me, it was the case as well when I first translated orally. And, when, uh, sorry? When was that? It was uh, also with Drupal uh, Mwangiramuchi. And he was, he, one day he was, uh, he, he was there in Nyamadzong and then there were children around and he, uh, He told, he told me he knew French, so he, obviously he was up to something with me. And he said, okay, I'm going to talk to these uh, children, so please come and translate. And so while I was just there, I was freaked out, and then I was forced to say something, have something come out of my mind, because, mouth, because he just said, and people were waiting. But then afterwards, uh, I felt also that it was terrible. And yeah, I had the chance that they were children, so they were kind. They didn't say anything to me. <laughs> Very good. And yeah, I would like to know also, uh, so when you started translating more and more, I guess, and then you became more uh, close to the teachers who were uh, around you and then saw you in that way as a translator. And then is there something particular that they share with you that helped you in the process of learning translation, whether it, it is oral translation or written translation? Yes. Jogi Nimbe Rinpoche, he says, it's all right to leave out something, but don't add anything else in, something extra. Try to clarify what the teacher says. That's unnecessary. And when we add too many synonyms or different ways of saying the same thing, the teacher speaks in five minutes and you end up uh, speaking 10 minutes. Uh, he doesn't like that. That's one thing. The other thing is to, to uh, interpolate, that is something Tinder Novarim uh, said, don't interpolate means add in your own ideas, not just vari uh, variations of uh, uh, translation words, but something extra. For example, what Freud said or, uh, about the nature of mind. <laughs> Anything that has nothing to do with teaching, uh, just keep it for yourself. Don't volunteer uh, something totally uh, unnecessary. And also the most important is don't get distracted. Don't let your uh, attention wander to other things other than the sound of the voice, if it's an oral translation. But uh, stay in the, with um, attention to the, to the nowness to the moment, what's being heard, and then the other attention is to repeat it in a way that the listener can understand it very uh, easily. And if you have a choice between using um, Greek or Latin or a word in your own language, like English or Danish, then use your own language. Like Don't say gnosis for yes. That's absurd. And uh, it's it's very difficult to uh, know when we can actually adapt. And I think the the difference between adapting to the audience and sometimes changing what the teacher said a little bit because it gives us the impression that the audience understands it better. I, I found in my own experience, I find myself many times uh, paraphrasing way too much. And I had for a long time, uh, I still have actually the, the difficulty to find the right, um, uh, of, uh, right uh, balance between adapting and interpreting. 
or trying to adapt. And then the worst thing for me was when I was not agreeing with what I was supposed to be translating and this kind of situation, what, what would you do? That's the last time you translate for that person. <laughs> Unfortunately, it was not. Because <laughs> yeah. you can't sit and disagree in front of other people. No. You have to just uh, uh, put yourself aside on your own opinions. And then afterwards, you can disagree. But not in the normal way of uh, disagreeing, but say, uh, uh, in the West, this topic is very difficult to understand because people are unused to um, spirits and um, seeing past and future lives. Uh, as if it is something we can see in front of our eyes. And all the um, topics that are easily believed by Tibetans are not so easily believed by people from other cultures. That you can uh, argue about separately, but not in, in front of people. No. No. No, this I, I, I managed not to do. And I managed to swallow and then to actually say what I didn't agree with. But uh, I saw one, um, one translator who, who said, Rinpoche says such and such, but I feel it means such and such. <laughs> and um, the Rinpoche, he understood English enough, so he fired him on the spot. He said, you don't have to come tomorrow. I'll find somebody else. And then he, he told me that uh, if I may me make mistakes, it's my mistakes, and I take full responsibility for it. He didn't make any mistakes. It was just the translator who was on an uh, ego trip. But uh, he never got to translate for that um, teacher again. I won't say his name. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And so how, how would you view the difference between adapting and starting to interpret? When can we know that we have to ring the alarm? And then how do we know that we have to stop there and then be more literal, more faithful? It depends on the context. If it is an, um, a situation where people who are not there for necessary for practicing to, to, to learn how to practice, but more they will meet this teacher once and then may never see him again. Then it's important to focus on meaning rather than words. And the interpretation is then fine. Because that person has to leave with a, a positive impression, which is helpful for the rest of their life. The other is being too much of a stickler or pedantic about the choice of words because that's how it is in my list or the dictionary I use. That is um, a little unkind, uh, not just a little, very unkind. Because the most important is to get the meaning right and secondary, the words. In, in writing, in written translation, then it's different then you have to be much more of a perfectionist. And that's fine because you have the time. The readers of your translation, you may never see them. You may die before they even see the book. So it doesn't matter. You can just take your time and find the right words. But there's a whole different uh, policy for written translation and for oral the translation. And uh, sometimes it might not be that we want to sound very uh, scholarly or very, uh, very learned or very pedantic, but maybe at the beginning, when we first start to translate, we feel like we're not really on, on the right spot. Maybe we don't. Uh, we're not worth what we are asked to do. So we want to live up to the expectation that people have put in us. And then we try to be like that. So this brings to the question of when do we know exactly where, uh, when we can start and when can we be confident about, okay, now I can translate. 
from your experience and looking uh, orally or, or in writing uh, both but let's uh, start orally since we're talking about orally right until now it's when when you are asked to do it that's the the, the, the right time so we you should try to get out of it but there's nobody else so then you just have to do it and try and do your best but writing it's different then you can uh, you can wait as long as possible, you know, up to 10 years before you show it, anybody what you have done. Because you have time to correct and have a uniform vocabulary. It's fine to wait 10 years. Great. And uh, so coming back to learning or to the training part, uh, if Imagining that today you had to learn all of your everything. voice just cut out. Ah, so yes. Could you re Sorry. repeat the yes. last two sentences? Yes. So I was, yeah, I was saying, uh, coming back to the, to the training part, if today you were given the chance to start all over again this training, the studies, etc., uh, learning as the language, Tibetan language as well as uh, the text. Uh, would you do it differently than the way you have done, or would you do it different in a, in the same way? Is there something that uh, my idea is? What can we learn from uh, your experience? I have to think about that. This is the situation has changed gradually, drastically. And when I learned Tibetan, there was no computers. There were no Dharma dictionaries. There, if we had to copy a text, we did it by hand. And I'm old, even though I look very young. And I'm old. <laughs> so at that time, uh, there was no photocopy machines. And when we get, got hold of a little text, we were so happy. These days, you, can, you have so many books available for download um, Tibetan PDFs. I have on a hard disk 10,000 volumes uh, almost, and I never look at them. But in those days, if even one little book was read many times. So quality was emphasized. There was no quantity to, to take. So the beginning was to learn to read and absorb the literary tradition. But the most important is to get the oral lineage from the teacher's voice right into your ears and into your heart. That's more important than reading. And I don't feel that there's anything I could have done better in in the context where I grew up, I um, was distracted a lot. Um, and uh, that was uh, how we were at that time. We partied a lot and, um, and there was much more hanging out together uh, as a group of friends. Th these days, uh, uh, it's more uh, separately, you study by yourself and you speak over the phone or like now over the internet. And in those days, um, we used to study together and then get more teaching and then go back and study the text uh, again together, the same text going over it again and again. So, Rather than designing the perfect situation, I would suggest to make the best of the situation that you are already in. Whichever it is and wherever you are in the world. Thank you. So the, the situation you're describing looks more like uh, the situation of studying in the shadow where you go in the, in the morning to receive the uh, teachings from the Kempo, then you go back and study with the others or by your own? Um, I did that a lot. 
there were different campus. But I must say that the, the greatest benefit was one-on-one uh, -on -one from a meditation teacher, like Chugu Wojin Rinpoche and Chugu Nyema Rinpoche, what listening to their voice and being able to ask questions about uh, every single word uh, in some uh, essential text brings uh, more benefit for myself uh, than reading through thousands of pages of things that are easy to forget and may not uh, reach into your present moment of how to be there. So there seems to be uh, quite a component of practice in the way you approach translation. What yeah, I was interested in, in translation. It, it just came um, uh, accidentally or there was more and more need for uh, translating for Toko Ajin, who I learned from, uh, meditation from. People would come and, and ask questions. And because of that, I had to um, find a whole vocabulary that was understandable based on his explanations. And then slowly he gave me different texts to study on my own, different things by Long Chempa or uh, others. And then he, he would say, you study it and then you tell, repeat to me what the most important parts are that you have understood. And then we can discuss them. So Wojin was not one who would go through uh, thick books and give um, explanations. Only if you asked, then he would give a long explanation on a few words. But if you gave him a, a text, he would say he would just read it loud, and then say, "This is so good, I cannot improve uh, uh, improve upon that uh, at all." And then he would put it on his head and then wrap it up, and no explanation. And I think you will find that when you translate uh, orally, that when you ask a question about something specific, then you may uh, get a long uh, explanation, which is really helpful, rather than just, would you uh, teach me this text? Depends on the teacher, but that has been my experience. So, yeah, so it looks like uh, the translation you have been doing are, were mostly for people who are receiving instructions on practice, not so much no, on the uh, academic not side. At all. Not, at uh, all. not at all. I've translated many books okay. um, also, but uh, most of them I've been asked to do. And one of your questions is about whether one should be an academic or done yes. three-year retreat. I'm not an academic and I have not done three-year retreat. Okay. <laughs> I've done three-year retreats if I uh, add it all up, but not as a, you can say, a standard uh, where I get three stars on my shoulder, uh, not like that. <laughs> Not that someone closed your door and says, okay, now you don't come out for three years. No, I haven't done that. Okay, so yeah, maybe we can uh, go through the questions that were... Yeah, go ahead. Uh, ...that our participants... So let I just go in the, in the order of mm -hmm. uh, where they were written down. Yep. So the first one was, uh, could you tell us about, about how being able to spend time with your teachers helped you in your process of becoming a translator. Could you share any advice that they gave to you? Technical advice or general one? Yeah, I, I shared one already, with, which is don't get distracted. Yes. That's the most important. And the first one, uh, begin with kindness. The altruistic mind or attitude. The two most important things. Because when you begin with the bodhicitta, automatically 
um, uh, arrogance and uh, irritation against the audience or the person who's uh, asking, it has a harder time to take over. Like when you have uh, altruistic uh, uh, attitude here and um, um, the ego trip here, that altruistic uh, attitude wins uh, each time. But that's a personal uh, fight that you have to uh, uh, do inside. You don't say it loud. And yes, so about not getting distracted, I found that extremely difficult, especially when we have. Uh, you have to do. You have to do a certain breathing practice. That's the most uh, easy. You hold your breath in a particular way that uh, calms the mind, and you uh, only have one. Uh, uh, way of being attentive, and that is to the uh, sound of the voice. Okay. Don't reflect uh, on, don't create too many ideas while uh, you're listening. Just mm -hmm. uh, naked listening. And for that, the sincerity and um, a noble, a noble heart or good heart is the most important way to be uh, undistracted together with the, the breathing practice. And uh, so uh, I, I don't know so much, but uh, how for, for me, when I try not to be distracted, I try to, I, I tend to forget what was said five minutes ago. And so with teachers who yeah. speak long times, is there some specific way that you have developed or you have learned or? Yeah, and, uh, don't get, don't get distracted in, in a simple way. It's not the same as concentrating very hard, okay. but it, uh, you settle in yourself in a very relaxed way and just pay attention. Okay. And uh, when you breathe in a particular way, there are less thoughts and uh, then you can automatically remember. Okay. It's not that you have to sit and try to remember. And I found that worked really well for me. For other people, it's necessary to take notes, like shorthand, the begin, uh, first word in each sentence or the main topics like that. But um, I've not been able to do that because I, I can't read my own handwriting. That happened to me also and was very embarrassing. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I never managed to, to do like you were, yeah, you were saying now reach this point of concentration where I simply don't forget. Uh, yes. So thank you. Uh, yes, and then any other technical advice or more general besides those ones before we move to the next question? You, you can carry on with the, with the questions. Okay. Yes. Otherwise, I have something else to say at the end. Okay, uh, so the second question is, uh, many say that in order to be a translator, one first need, either needs to be an academic or to have done a three-year retreat. Is that really the case? No. And, uh, no. <laughs> Thank you, simple answer. And according to experience, what do you consider essential to be a good Dharma translator? I say the most important is good heart, which is the, the normal way of saying compassion and kindness. It means that you're not trying to crowd or, or take over the, uh, the space between teacher and those who are being taught. You just remain in the background almost as you could say uh, invisible. That's the most important, not to put yourself in and not make faces or make jokes or anything like that. Just keep a low profile. And then the other thing is to um, try to be as clear as possible. But the wish may 
you and all the other people through you uh, who will be connected with you, may all of you have understanding and be free. That uh, attitude is the most important requirement. Because without that, what are you doing? Right? Yes, right. Could belong to, it could be in any, any other context. The same principle always wins. Right, the good heart good. is clearer to understand. Like the teacher who yells at you is harder to remember their words than the one who speaks gently. Because that, my experience is if somebody if, um, pressures or blames me or uses harsh tone, I do like this, and then I can't listen. Unless I become like uh, almost invisible, then the, uh, the ammunition, some teachers, they uh, teach as if they're shooting bullets. Then I can just let them uh, pass through me and then no problem. But otherwise it's uh, unpleasant. It's very nice to hear on the, uh, the the same thing that we hear at the beginning of each teaching, the motivation and developing the bodhicitta or in clearer words or more normal words, kindness, like you were saying, and then the attention. Usually we're used to hear things much more technical when it comes to translation, knowing this and that, having that and that knowledge, etc. So it's kind of refreshing to have this no, other voice coming from you. All of that is uh, secondary importance. You have to know Abhidharma, you have to know the Vinaya, you have to know Pratna Paramita, etc., etc. That's not really the main point. Mm -hmm. It really isn't. The main point is to free minds. Don't you agree? Yes. Uh, all yes. of you. Certainly. Okay, so now the next question. Uh, you consider that being kind to the reader is one of the most important aspects in translation. Yes. You have said that kindness is sometimes more important than being precise. How do you find the balance between being kind and clarity? Is it difficult sometimes? No, it's not difficult. To Gupema Wangyal, he said, uh, translate or teach with spontaneous compassion. Spontaneous compassion. That's a one sentence he just said, and it has stayed with me for uh, all the years. It was in the 70s. Spontaneous compassion. What could that mean in this context? It means you, you have to be in a um, relaxed, um, you could call it meditative, but sometimes people misunderstand the word meditation to mean that you're doing something uh, other than being present. And that means you are occupied. But this kind of meditative state I refer to here is being unoccupied and your mind has been freed up. And because of, of being freed up, there's room for kindness and, and goodwill. And there, therefore you are very relaxed. You're not out to do anything or accomplish something in specific. You're just being there. So you're relaxing yourself for a while and then speak. And how long is that for a while? That's individual. If you're not used to just resting in yourself while being unoccupied, then please get used to it. Because it's so important. Can't be a translator without being a little bit of a meditator. Not for Buddhist topics, but technical, um, how to fix a radio and all this, I don't know about but 
you don't have to discuss that. But for, for Buddhist uh, teachings, you have to be a bit of a meditator, at least in the sense of shamatha with a, just a, a splash of vipassana now and then. And we already are that. The kind of shamatha and vipassana I talk about here is the uh, way that all minds are. When uh, this mind is not busy or uh, occupying with ideas of this and that, that is, uh, you can say, basic shamatha. Uh, everyone can experience that. And the passana within this is to pay attention. And then because of being calm, you can e much more easily understand. That's the, the passana uh, quality there. And everybody has that. When they take the phone, they don't start talking before you know who, who's, or if there even is someone in the other end. First you say hello, and then you wait. That's samatha. And then when you hear who it is, you can speak and say, oh, it's Tara. Hello, how are you? That's the vipassana. So you have to first take a, a step back from the situation and then speak afterwards. The same for translation. First, you erase yourself and your, all your inner uh, busyness and panic or whatever it is, let it all calm down and then speak. Great. Thank you very much. Now, another question that is uh, very short. What do you consider a bad translation? Too much uh, ego makes every translation bad, even when it's correct. How can we too, too much me, me, me uh, in the sentence. That's one thing. And then when it comes to the topics that are based on already having seen through the illusion of I. For example, the Hinayana teachings, Mahayana teachings, Vajrayana. Don't put too much personal pronoun into the sentences. For example, in, when you translate about shunyata or the nature of mind, don't put the word I, my shunyata, or when I, um, when I, meditate on Trinita. Not like that in Tibetan. It is a Tongkonyi Gomba, which means getting used to or uh, becoming uh, familiar with uh, Trinita. It's not that I meditate on Trinita as if it is me here, Trinita there, and then I meditate on that. That's called interpolating dualistic uh, attitude into a teaching where it does not, not exist. It had already been uh, demasked, seen through, uh, realized to some extent. That's a very important point. I've never seen a, um, a text where it's written to meditate on Shunyata, as if it was an object. It could be called thinking about Junyata or contemplating the, the value of the realizing Junyata, but meditating on Junyata, that's complete nonsense. Sorry to say. Mm -hmm. And all the inner Mahayana teachings are like that. You can't med meditate on the non-arising of all phenomena. It's impossible, but you can acknowledge it and get more and more familiar with the uh, effect, the, the reality of that. So uh, not much me in the translation. Uh, is that something that the reader can see through or is that only we as translator yes. we have to get? They feel it immediately as if, if there is too much salt in the soup. Or as when you, another thing is to uh, uh, cloud 
the a clear meaning with too many words, mm. uh, too difficult words, especially poetry. Tony Rinpoche, he said, a translation that is like uh, eating sand. Yes. Do you remember how it is to eat sand <laughs> when, when you were small? Yes, at the beach. <laughs> hard to swallow. Easy to put in the mouth, but hard to swallow. It does not reach uh, the heart. And Tugu Ojin Rinpoche, he said another, um, be, uh, be sure while you speak or while you write, know what you're going to say uh, so that you have no doubt, no uh, uncertainty. Because doubt and uncertainty does something to the tone of your voice that transmits not certainty, but transmits uncertainty. And don't say, I guess it's like this. Don't ever say that. Because then the next person who either reads it or hears it would be in doubt uh, from the beginning. Yes. <clears throat> and, and that brings me to a question of, it happened many times that I didn't dare re-ask the teacher to reformulate what he had just said because he showed that he was not happy or because I was just too impressed. And many times I didn't understand what he said and so kind of said something that I myself didn't understand quite well. Did that happen to you or what would you do in this kind of situation? Then you just have to say sorry. Sorry, you can cut off my head, but I don't understand. <laughs> You have to know what you're going to say. Otherwise, it uh, doesn't help the other people. Then if you have a um, short-tempered teacher who is impatient, then it may be the last time you need to translate for that person. You can say, maybe first get your personality in, in order, <laughs> and then, then teach afterwards. But that's a little harsh to say, right? Especially when Just, we try to avoid having me in, in, the, in the equation. Yeah, it's, um, that's a difficult. To, but then you have to be patient. Just to try your best if it's like that. Now, or even better, prepare yourself with the teacher before uh, the teaching. Yes. Go through the whole thing. So you're familiar. And can be sure and certain, and then you can speak. Thank you. So, well, yes. so the first uh, bad thing about the translation is the me inside the ego trip. What would be a second worst thing? Misunderstanding to transmit the wrong ideas. Yes. Anything after that? No, there's nothing worse than that. <laughs> For example, to get to Bugaya you, from Nepal, you have to travel south. And then you translate it as, you have to travel north. <laughs> Okay, so uh, next question. In a talk with uh, Catherine Dalton, you have stated, I don't see any difference between translating and teaching Dharma because I don't try to make up anything of my own. Could you expand on this point, please? That was a, a personal point about how I feel right now. But I wouldn't uh, suggest that uh, everybody follows that. So that belonged to a specific uh, context. Okay. But yes. today, um, since I'm now supposed to be a Dhamma teacher, when, when I um, try to explain something, I do it exactly in the same way as if I was translating. 
Yes, I think I remember from uh, your talk that you said that you still imagine Chukun Yamaramuchi behind your shoulder and then looking at you and making sure that everything is right when you yeah, say that, right? That's very good. Also, because then you don't come with personal inventions. Here in the, our schooling system, we are taught that please invent something on your, of, of your own, um, say it in your own way, draw your own paintings, uh, create your own music. That's uh, considered very good, and while uh, imitating is bad. Mm -hmm. In the uh, Asian cultures, uh, imitating is good, inventing is bad. So that has to be adjusted uh, slowly uh, in the right way. I can't come up with a, a final a solution to that right now. It's Step true. one, be uh, honest and sincere. That should solve uh, most problems. Okay. And this is something that I found because I was, I, I, did my school in France, so I had this kind of people telling me, teachers telling me, you should invent, be creative, uh, think by yourself, etc. And then when I was in the shared garden, it was all the opposite. Uh, we yeah. were told the Buddha knew everything already. We're not inventing anything new. We're just expanding on what he says. And so it's kind of two contradicting ways of being, uh, ways of thinking. It's seemingly contradiction contradictory, but not really. The Buddha also taught very different ways to different people. The Jataka tales were for normal people and the monks vows and nuns vows, not for normal people. So different context, different vocabulary. And when he taught the inner Mahayana on that nothing ever arose, nothing ever disappears, Nothing exists even in the moment. That was for very specific context also. He taught in many different ways. So that would be the kind of uh, thinking by our own or the creative part. The Buddha was uh, transcendentally creative. You can't get more creative uh, than that. And the, the humility that is embedded in the Asian tradition is very beautiful, but it's also a limitation. And we have to dance around that here in, in the West and make, make sure that what is presented in the end is something that uh, makes everybody grow and uh, unfold in a positive way. So the second half of that question was, if you, even if you're not making up anything on your own, wouldn't you consider that the process of translation is more bound to its source than the process of teaching, which might allow for different methods of teaching and adjustment to the student? So referring to the fact that you're not inventing anything and it was the same teaching and tran translating. Yeah, you just do your best and be happy about that but also leave room for that it could be even better tomorrow. And I do invent some things like uh, metaphors and examples that are from our present time. But I don't see them as inventions because they can be more easily understandable for the audience. Mm -hmm. Like in the in the sutras, you don't find much about uh, airplanes or um, uh, automobiles and how to shift gear, stuff like that. So you can say that those are personal inventions from today. That's, that's not so important. Mm -hmm. Most important is to, does it make sense? Does it lift the uh, reader or the listener? They should open their minds. That's the most important. Okay. So uh, bringing metaphors and images of today's world would be part of the creative 
uh, side of translation or teaching or? Uh, only teaching, not translation. Not translation. There you have to use the old examples about how long a sheep tail is and how a yak um, eats grass, stuff like that. So translation you wouldn't allow yourself to uh, creativity or maybe to some extent. No. No, not at all. No creativity. I don't think so. No. No. We allow people to say, what do you mean by how a yak is eating grass? And then the teacher will explain what it means. It means starting from one end and consistently go through until you reach the end. Yes. So even adapting the metaphors in the, in the translation, you wouldn't undo. No, uh, uh, the people who listen, if, if, if it's a live uh, audience, they are intelligent enough to uh, ask a question if they don't understand. Right. Yes. And that's very interesting to hear from you because the difference between creativity in translation or being very literal is tricky sometimes. I think it's, a, it's actually, it gives some color to have metaphors that are from the time of the Buddha or metaphors that are from Tibet. Yeah, I don't mind. Right. Uh, just like I don't mind when I was younger to learn new technical words for what is going on inside the computer when the, the programs. Right. It's a long list yeah. of new words. P people are able to learn new things like in the moment. Yes. So in order to be kind to our reader, we don't need to oversimplify things. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So now the last question. How is it uh, you trust yourself to the point of feeling comfortable not to search for precision? And then I fear uh, that... Yes? No, um, uh, I wouldn't say that I... Uh, uh, throw precision away, I never meant that. Okay. But the most important is to get the clear meaning uh, across. As you know, for in the old days, there was debate about the uh, little literal translation and the meaning translation, yes. Sikyur and Dunkyur. And the Dunkyur was the most important, but the translators like Verutsana who could translate both, uh, literal and meaning in the same sentence is, of course, the, the best. Yes. And usually, Dengur was seen like a higher level of the craft that very few people could attempt, right? Yeah, aim for that. But then wait 10 years before you show something, maybe. Yes. <laughs> if you have the chance. <laughs> so that you don't publish something too early and then have to pull it back uh, or regret it uh, afterwards. One of my friends, he, we, when he was 25, he published a work on meditation uh, from the Harvard uh, University. And he said he regretted it the rest of his life. Uh, this is also a difficult question for um, people like us who are starting, because if you want to be translators full time, then we don't have so much the leisure to wait for 10 years before we can receive what enables us to live out of that work. Uh, yes. How would you suggest that we navigate around this? You become an assistant translator first before becoming a, a translator. And that means someone who compares the work that has already been translated together with the Tibetan and find the word is missing or um, a sentence that is totally left out. That's a very important work. Yeah. And you can learn so much by doing so. I've done that uh, mm -hmm. many, many times going through other people's translations. Mm -hmm. And then at the end, what do you have to show for it? Nothing. You may not even be mentioned in the acknowledgement, but you know what? It doesn't matter. That's not what the, the whole point is. It's not the main aim. The main aim is to help people. 
right. That looks like the Shuchong Yeah, they, that's a very mean. important to spend time doing that first. And then when you're really sure and you can translate without a dictionary, then you can um, publish your own work. Okay. Thank you. After your teacher has said, yes, go ahead. So always wait for a confirmation from our teachers. Yes. Good advice. So the, the second half of that uh, last question. It's the same with a cook. You don't start a restaurant and, and serve your food uh, expensively unless you have learned how to cook uh, properly. You have the white hat. What happens? You go bankrupt because people puke and they never come back. <laughs> That's true. That's true. We should look around and see how other professions are doing. And then it's, it's true for cooking. You spend like a few years just being a commie, uh, cutting vegetables and cleaning things before you, you are allowed to have this white hat. Yeah. Um, it, it takes a like while. In, it looks like in the in the translation world of the Dharma, people are not so cautious or are not aware of such things so much. There is a, a lot of impatience in the, all of us. We just have to deal with that the best we can. And often ask our question, why am I doing this? What's the purpose? Before your uh, fingers touch the, the keyboard. <laughs> Ask yourself the question, what am I doing here? In exactly the same way as when you sit on the cushion, beginning a practice, it always begins with, what am I doing here? Why? And then you have a proper reply from yourself, not from somebody else. Yes. Isn't that true? Yes. But it sounds difficult, but nothing. So it's not necessary. difficult to ask yourself the, the, that question. Maybe the answer is more difficult. No, it's not difficult. When you set yourself into a car, don't you have a clear idea where you're going first? You don't yes. just start it and drive. You may drive into the neighbor's uh, garden. That's true. <laughs> because you go, you have to go somewhere. In the Translation work is actually serious business. It, uh, it reaches into other people's minds who are looking for answers on how to lead their life and how to really find not just meaning, but uh, realization. So that is a right. serious business. Yes. There could be nothing more. It's more important than heart transplant. It's an attitude transplant. The most important thing, so you don't want to guide people in the wrong way or in the wrong direction. If you ask yourself, what are you really doing here? What is the purpose? What is the point? Pastor remember he says that about a thousand times in the words of my perfect teacher. So it's not something I made up. Yes, it's true. I'm still hearing the same thing uh, through what you say every time, and I, it's very reconforting to hear when, that. When most teachers they begin with, now please adjust your motivation and uh, take the attitude of a bodhisattva, and then go immediately go on, that's too fast. We have to make sure that we're actually doing it also, not just saying it or you're repeating it to, to others. That's really important. You can just uh, settle in yourself and let it come. Uh, that reason why I'm about to translate these words is because I really want everyone to be free, not just happy. That's, um, it's a, I feel it's a wrong translation of, um, of uh, Happiness is uh, 
is too superficial. Mm -hmm. It's like, may everybody have a smiley instead of their face. It, that's not what the Dewa means. It means totally free, at peace. Mm -hmm. Free, at peace. It's better than happy in that context. Okay. So more of something like the thank you Dewa or the kind of stable happiness. Yeah. Not just happiness, but uh, the freedom. freedom. Peace. Peace. Being at ease. So in that context. Otherwise it's like mm -hmm. handing, handing candy out to all sentient beings. May you have a chocolate candy and be happy. Yes. <laughs> so we have to be more grown up than that. Any other question? So just the, the end of the this question, I feel that every example, every turn of phrase of my Rinpoche, that my uh, Rinpoche utters, the very rhythm of his speech are designed for the audience of the moment and comes from an insight that can't fathom. What is your reflecting, reflection or feeling towards that? So that was in the end of after the question about uh, precision over uh, being more free. You can't start with that. That comes after some years mm -hmm. where you're so uh, familiar with or at home with the teacher's uh, attitude and use of language that you can almost uh, imitate his uh, face expressions and hand gestures and uh, attitude when he tells a story. You can't start like that. It comes through um, becoming really good friends with that teacher. And then you can, it's like learning uh, to play a tune. This difference between doing da, 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 and then, oh yeah, it sounded right. Not like that, but you've done it so many times, you can play it with, with uh, um, passion uh, rather than just uh, following the notes. So what you say is totally right, but it's uh, not for beginners. Okay. And so yeah, that brings me to uh, the, a translation that would be exact and that would be kind of technically okay. And then being able to, not on top of that, bring the feeling that the teacher has, uh, like the tone or the playfulness or the seriousness. And so uh, how do you think this is important as well? How would you go about yes. But it? Yes, but you wait until it comes uh, by itself. Okay. You can't force that. It's the same as uh, people in uh, first and second grade in school cannot uh, play Hamlet uh, or any other Shakespeare character yet. It comes later. Okay, yes. But it's good to be aware of it, mm -hmm. that, that one doesn't begin as an expert. But there's right. room to grow and become better. And it's perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. Perfectly fine. Yes. Okay, so we have uh, reached the end of, of the questions. I'd like to say a few words. Then that is, I'm very happy that uh, uh, you and others who see this will uh, use the precious time that you're using your precious time to make something uh, that I regard as the most valuable in this world, the transmission of the uh, insight of understanding, how to uh, promote that through kindness and uh, the best type of will that is possible, the altruistic uh, will. And so I'd like to thank you for that. But remember that translation work, whether it's um, uh, oral, uh, in the moment, kind of spontaneously uh, taking place, not prepared, or whether you are 
in front of a text where you can look at it again and again, please understand that translation takes place from your mind, from your heart, to the reader's heart, to the reader's mind. I don't make any distinction here between mind and heart. It's the same thing. It's the real person, which is uh, at the receiving end of uh, your choice of words. So it's basically always a mind to mind transmission by the means of words, either the spoken word or the written word. And that is how everything for the function in the human realm, we get uh, communicated meaning through words. In the moment, the spoken words are more important, but in the long run, the written words are the of utmost importance. Like words from the Buddha that were written down can still exist today. And that's only because it was put down in writing. If it had only been repeated, it would have been changed in all different ways. So please, as often as you can, find the sincerity of wanting not only this mind, but the mind that is the receiver to be totally free and uh, at peace and also be able to benefit a vast number of other beings. That is uh, the most important attitude. And all the other skills of the trade, like uh, if you're a carpenter, to cut the wood, to shave it, and to sand it, and to make it into different things, that's secondary. The attitude that you're relating from the innermost part of your being to another person's innermost part of their being, that is how the reality of translation is. So please handle it with utmost care. It's something of the most precious thing, how to transmit knowledge and understanding. So it's an important task, but we have to be very careful and not too much in a rush. All right. So thank you very much. Thank you very thank much you for very having much. Spend this time with us. It was very inspiring a lot of things that we are sure to learn and to integrate from what you have said all right thank you i think all have good results in different ways small results are worth a lot big results not necessarily worth more it's the quality that matters rather than quantity Would you accept to give us another talk with specific examples that you have come across, like the one, some examples that you gave about um, specific uh, contexts that were badly translated, uh, badly translated in the past, or badly not badly but um, misinterpreted in the past, or? you know, examples that you came across throughout your experience as a translator. Would you uh, consider? <laughs> I'd rather not. <laughs> there are enough bad examples. I would rather have good examples. Or good examples. <laughs> good example is that while I have been alive, I've seen that the Dhamma can be transmitted in the English language and also in the other languages uh, um, like French, German, and so, and, and so forth, Spanish. And that makes me very happy. There's no reason really to, to pick on too many mistakes. If you look at in, just to mention one in the old Chandra Das dictionary. I don't know if it exists anymore. It does. does it? Yeah. Try to look up the word the Sangtal. Sangtal. Yeah. See what it says there. <laughs> that shows a little bit about the level of understanding at that time. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you very much. 
Thank you. Bye-bye.